thank you, Jonathan, for uh, introducing me and also for inviting me. And uh, it's such an honor to be with all of you. And uh, I especially love seeing uh, Sister Manny J, who uh, attends our church often. And uh, I heard Sister Mitra also uh, attends our church. Uh, Good morning, Pat. Good morning, uh, Sister Mitra. Wonderful uh, hearing you. I don't see you here, but uh, great to hear your voice. And I was especially happy to see that uh, Sister Manny J has a cat who uh, loves to participate in prayer. <laughs> a holy cat. <laughs> Instead of a holy cow, a holy cat. <laughs> but uh, anyway, praise God for uh, uh, this group and uh, how it's growing. And I want to thank each of you for your, uh, oh, I think I have to re uh, acknowledge a meeting is recorded. Okay. Thank all of you for uh, really devoting to uh, these prayer times and your commitment to what God is doing around the world. It's it's exciting uh, to be part of, of uh, God's work and how his kingdom is advancing. Uh, we're uh, excited to see and hear reports from around the world about what is happening. Uh, so, uh, Jonathan, I don't know if uh, you're able to play that short four-minute video. Yeah, I've got it right here. Just, it's a four-minute video uh, talking about praying for the Taliban in Afghanistan. Praise God. Thank you, uh, Jonathan, for showing that video. Uh, that video, by the way, is put out by a prayer cast organization, and uh, they uh, put out a video for a Muslim group each day uh, during this uh, month of Ramadan. Uh, so uh, it's a wonderful uh, uh, opportunity to learn about the different people groups throughout the Muslim world and focus on special prayer for each of these people groups. Uh, as it said in that video, we pray that the love of our Lord Jesus and the peace of our Lord Jesus would uh, replace the hatred and violence uh, that has existed for centuries in Afghanistan. Uh, I just wanted to share a little bit about the spiritual hunger of Muslims. Uh, and uh, we uh, see uh, there uh, is such a uh, desperate cry coming from the Muslim world, people that have been trapped under the darkness of this religion. And uh, they are desperate to come out from uh, the, uh, the uh, bonds of Islam. And uh, so many are, uh, praise God, coming to know our Lord Jesus. And, uh, you know, uh, especially praying for the Taliban in Afghanistan, uh, we pray that many of the leaders who you see have such zeal uh, that they will have Damascus Road experiences, like our the Apostle Paul, who was so zealous uh, for uh, propagating uh, the, the Jewish faith and arresting Christians. But uh, then he had the Damascus experience and the encounter with our Lord Jesus, and uh, his life was dramatically changed. We're seeing some of that among Taliban leaders and just continue to pray that, that many, many more will turn to Christ and bring that zeal that they have uh, for the Lord. Uh, I'd ask a special prayer for the current leader of Afghanistan. His name is Habitullah Akhun Zadeh, Zadeh. And uh, he is the, the Taliban leader, and his goal is to reinstitute the Sharia law. And so they're restarting uh, public floggings, public stonings of women, uh, just uh, bringing hell on earth. And uh, so please, please pray uh, that these leaders. Uh, will be restrained and stopped from uh, you know, perpetrating 
uh, ongoing evil throughout uh, Afghanistan. Uh, and you know, it's interesting that we see the zeal that many Muslims have. They're willing to give their lives for a lie. It, you know, puts Christians to shame because we are called uh, to be living sacrifices for the truth. Present our bodies as living sacrifices. And uh, so, you know, I love that passage in Romans chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, where the Apostle Paul says, My heart, desire, and prayer for the Israelites is that they may be saved. We can substitute uh, Muslims in place of Israelites. Our uh, heart, desire, and prayer for Muslims is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. They don't have the knowledge of God's truth. They don't know that Jesus is more than a great prophet, that he is God incarnate. He is the word of God. How much they need to know this truth, and then they can bring that zeal uh, that they have uh, to follow God's truth and and live for the Lord and and be involved in in uh, uh, God's kingdom, the advancement of God's kingdom. Uh, you know, verse three of that passage goes on to say they do not know the righteousness that comes from God, and so they've sought to establish their own. And we see that in Islam, it's much like. Uh, Judaism, it's it's uh, following laws and religious rituals, uh, but there's no personal faith, personal knowledge of God, no uh, understanding of how much God loves us. And uh, so they've sought to establish their own righteousness through these laws, the Sharia laws. And uh, this, uh, as you know, it's especially oppressive uh, for the women. Uh, you know, I in reading uh, Jonathan's book, I read about how I just started reading yesterday, and I can't put it down, Jonathan. It's a beautiful book, 10 Days, uh, The Global Movement of Mourning for the Return of Jesus. Uh, uh, I've been so blessed. And one thing that really jumped out at me, you pointed out uh, in your journey, the many lessons that you've been learning, uh, Proverbs 19 Two and three also go on to say, it is not good to have zeal without knowledge, nor to be hasty and miss the way. A man's folly ruins his life. His heart rages against the Lord. So not only do we need to know the truth, know our Lord Jesus, and bring that zeal under his lordship, but we need to have the wisdom of God. And how we go about our prayers, our work, our serving the Lord. Uh, we need that special wisdom uh, to guide us in our zealousness, in our earnestness for serving the Lord. You know, also, uh, I was reading how uh, you're one of your first uh, successful 10 day prayer times so was held at Northfield. Uh, in Massachusetts, Western Massachusetts, at the uh, college uh, that Dwight L. Moody started. Actually, he started it as a high school. And uh, that's the uh, origin of the uh, uh, student volunteer mission. Uh, there was a haystack prayer meeting, <laughs> a famous haystack prayer meeting where the students went under the hay when it started raining and continued their prayer. And through this uh, revival or great awakening, uh, there were uh, over 20,000 missionaries. They were sent out from America over a 20 year period. Amazing, amazing. Uh, and we're gonna see uh, that again, I know, but uh, what a joy to look at history and see how God has worked these great awakenings that originated in New England. And you know, uh, my father, after uh, leaving Afghanistan, they had to leave because of uh, the threats and the church building that was uh, built there was torn down. Uh, so they went to Iran for one year 
Uh, and uh, my father wrote a book there entitled Afghanistan, The Forbidden Harvest. Uh, and uh, he wanted to be right on the border so that in case the Lord opened the door again, he could uh, go right back. But instead, uh, the door remained closed. And so he was invited to uh, become professor of missions and evangelism at Gordon-Conwell, uh, the seminary where both Jonathan and I went. And uh, through him being there at Gordon-Conwell, many of the seminary students uh, that took his classes, suddenly the whole world was open to them and the needs of the world and the opportunities for serving. So uh, many who thought that they were going to get a church somewhere in the U.S. suddenly were making plans to go to Pakistan and Iran and other Muslim countries as missionaries. And uh, my mother actually had to start a uh, meetings with the spouses uh, <laughs> to bring them up to speed on what was happening to their husbands, <laughs> because uh, the spouses were, were hearing all these new ideas about going to remote parts of the world. And uh, so my mom uh, uh, brought them up to speed. And so in God's uh, wisdom and, and plan, even though my father and mother had to leave Afghanistan, instead, many, many of his students ended up going back to those areas, including into Afghanistan. And uh, it's uh, exciting to see how God works. Uh, and, you know, uh, my grandfather went to uh, Iran in 1919, right at the end, end of World War I. Uh, and this was part of the whole uh, student volunteer missions movement uh, mm -hmm. that my grandfather and uh, grandmother and Dr. Miller, William Miller, uh, ended up going to Iran, and and my grandfather went to Western Iran, uh, Tabriz, where they speak Turkish, and Dr. Miller went to Mashhad, Eastern Iran, near the border of of Afghanistan, and uh, so my father uh, was born in Tabriz, Iran, and at the age of five, uh, he felt God's calling on his life uh, that when he grew up, he was to go to the neighboring country of Afghanistan as a missionary. And one Iranian pastor who heard that said, well, you know, missionaries aren't allowed in Afghanistan. <laughs> and my father at age five said, that's why I need to go to open the doors and plant the seeds of the gospel. Praise God for the Presbyterian missionaries who started going to Iran in the 1840s and uh, started schools and hospitals and re really laid the groundwork uh, of the planting the seeds of the gospel and bringing the love of Christ. You know, one of the schools that was started uh, by Dr. Jordan, all Iranians know Dr. Jordan, a great Presbyterian missionary who came from uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, one of the schools he started, he started many, but one is called Al Borz, Al Borz School, and it's still going on. It's recognized as like the MIT of uh, of Iran, a high quality. And so the Iranian people have such a respect for uh, these Presbyterian missionaries. And I believe that this is why we're seeing the the just the tremendous growth of the underground church now in Iran, uh, because of the faithfulness of these missionaries that laid that foundation of bringing the gospel to Iran. And, you know, uh, not only the ones in, in Iran, but in Pakistan, uh, for years, they were on the borders of Afghanistan, praying, praying on their knees daily, praying that God would open the door to Afghanistan. Uh, one of them was a wonderful woman I'm so sure some of you have heard, Flora Davidson, who was right on the northwest frontier. It was India at that time. It was before the partition, uh, but near the Khyber Pass. And she uh, and others prayed on their knees for years that God would open the door uh, for Afghanistan. And she wrote, there's a book entitled The Hidden Highway, how God heard these prayers and opened uh, highway uh, there. My father ended up going to Afghanistan as a teacher because missionaries were not allowed. And uh, 
uh, he, uh, you know, really advanced the idea of tent making missions. In other words, using your profession uh, to go into closed countries. Uh, so many came as teachers, doctors, uh, engineers, uh, and did amazing, amazing work uh, in Afghanistan. And that still is going on. Uh, my father realized that as different mission uh, organizations are interested in sending people in, uh, it was confusing to the Afghan government at that time. So my father recommended that they all come in under one umbrella uh, called the International Afghan Mission. The acronym is IAM, the great IAM. And uh, it changed the International Assistance Mission because they expanded their area to work in Pakistan and other nations, especially when the uh, Afghans uh, became refugees at the time of the Russian invasion. But uh, it was wonderful because it created no, a much simpler uh, idea for the Afghans to, and the officials to approve this. They're all coming under one organization, but it also promoted unity. Unity we, uh, between all the different denominations, Mennonites, Baptists, Presbyterians, Pentecostals, they all came in under this umbrella of IAM. And uh, uh, I know, uh, Jonathan, on, on your heart from the beginning was uh, the prayer and the desire to see unity among the followers of Christ. Uh, because that was the prayer of our Lord Jesus in John 17, uh, that the, his future believers, disciples, you and me, would have the same unity as what exists between the, the Father and the Son. Uh, and our Lord would pray that because he knew that uh, that would be the part of the main strategy of Satan to uh, prevent uh, this uh, uh, unity between believers and working together. And uh, uh, so we continue to pray for that. And, and we're seeing wonderful uh, uh, answers to these prayers for a greater unity. Please pray for us here in Los Angeles. Uh, that's been on my heart for years and other Iranian pastors. Unfortunately, there's, there's uh, Persian churches that are like separate isle islands. And instead of working together, they're all doing their own ministry separately. How much better it would be if we could all jointly work together in building God's kingdom. So please keep that in your prayers. We need a much greater unity among the Persian churches in uh, Los Angeles and Southern California, which has the largest expatriate Farsi-speaking uh, community in the world. Uh, both Iranians and Afghans and Tajiks. And so Satan is trying to keep a lock on churches from being more effective in reaching these uh, uh, Farsi-speaking people, uh, many of whom are so gifted and so, uh, uh, you know, uh, capable. Uh, you look at Iranians. They uh, moved uh, to Beverly Hills, where which is where our church is. We we partner with the uh, Beverly Hills Presbyterian Church. And uh, the Persians moved to Beverly Hills in 1978, before, just before the Islamic Revolution of Iran, because they saw what was coming. And most of them were the Jewish Persians. And so they brought their businesses and they purposely picked Beverly Hills as, as one of the most wealthy cities in America. And they came as millionaires and uh, established their businesses there, and then bought up a lot of the buildings that around UCLA and now that have become worth millions. So now these millionaire Iranians are billionaires. And <laughs> uh, we're praying that God would uh, bring more of them to faith in Christ so they can <laughs> release uh, their business skills and release the uh, financial resources for uh, God's kingdom, but more importantly, that they will uh, really come to know the Lord. And because uh, unfortunately, the many of their lives are empty. They're living in huge mansions uh, in Beverly Hills that are mainly empty. 
And then their children who are born here and grow up and, and rebel against their parents. And they just don't know uh, how to handle this, how much they need the Lord. Uh, please keep that in your prayers. And But we praise God for the way God opened the door for our church to be right in the heart of where uh, most Iranians and Afghans live. Uh, of course, the Afghans live closer to where Sister Manage lives, up in, in the valley area. But uh, we're, we're uh, excited to know that God is working, and uh, we're we're uh, anticipating wonderful, wonderful fruits in in the coming years. Uh, you know, Daniel chapter nine and ten, we see how Daniel uh, had the prayer battle, and he was battling against the Prince of Persia, who is the demonic power over uh, the hierarchies that have had a grip, have a grip uh, over the uh, Persia, uh, which includes Iran and Afghanistan. And, and, you know, they've had this grip, but I believe they're losing that grip because of the prayers of the saints like you. And I think this Taliban takeover two years ago is like a last desperate attempt of the demonic forces behind them to hold on to their power. They know they're being dislodged, and the church is underground churches are exploding. You've heard that Iran has the fastest growing uh, church in the world, and Afghanistan next door has the second fastest growing church. And uh, so we're uh, seeing amazing results. You know, uh, you've probably heard the report. Uh, I just heard it three months ago that in Iran, they've had 75,000 masjids or mosques. Uh, you know what? 50,000 of those 75,000 have closed. Can you believe in an Islamic uh, country that's run by Islamic uh, government, seven, two thirds of their mosques have closed. Why? because the Iranian people are fed up with Islam. They don't want to attend the mosque. They don't want anything to do with Islam. In fact, uh, they even are questioning to use the word salam <laughs> because they say that's too Islamic. They're, they're saying we should use a different word, darut bashama, that is, has no attachments to Islam. But I. I remind them, well, look, salam comes from shalom, and that's what our Lord used to, to greet people, uh, uh, shalom, peace be upon you. Uh, but uh, people are hungry to know God personally. Uh, there's such a spiritual hunger because Islam offers no forgiveness of sin and no assurance of salvation. And, you know, you've heard how their prophet, Muhammad, had an agonizing death, uh, screaming and crying and in pain, and he had no idea where he was going. Their own prophet uh, could not uh, assure his followers that they would have a place in paradise. Uh, you know, Zia Nodrat uh, is a hero uh, among Afghans. He's an Afghan himself. And my father uh, referred to him as the Apostle Paul of Afghanistan. And uh, in 1964, uh, he came to a blind school that my mother and father had started. They realized there was absolutely no work among the blind of Afghanistan. So uh, the Lord led them to start a blind school. So uh, here comes a student. I remember him. I was a, uh, a, a little younger than him, but a very thin uh, young man, age 14, uh, completely blind from birth. And, you know, he had memorized the whole Quran in Arabic, which my father said is the equivalent of us memorizing the whole New Testament in Greek. <laughs> and he was... Uh, uh, paid to go to the mosques and recite the Quran uh, in Arabic from memory. Uh, but uh, when he came uh, to the school, we realized he, uh, my parents realized he was listening to radio broadcasts through the transistor radio and was t tuning in to Christian radio programs. 
And so he started coming to my father with very deep theological questions. <laughs> Some that my father said, well, Z, I'm not really sure the answer. I have to do a little research into that. But we realized that this young man was a genius. And he went through all the grades of the blind school, the primary uh, grades, in three years instead of uh, six, seven, eight years. Uh, and then... Uh, he came to uh, the school one day and, and said to my mother and father, I just wanted to let you know I am now a Christian. I've received Christ as my Savior. Uh, and my father said, well, Zia, you know, there can be a great cost to that here in such an Islamic uh, country. And he said, I am ready to give my life because my Lord Jesus gave his life for us. And it was a prophetic statement because that's exactly what happened. Years later, he became a martyr. But before that, he God used him mightily, and he truly was a genius. He went uh, to the sighted schools uh, and became the number one student in high school in all, the whole country. Then he went on to Kabul University and became the top student there, uh, studying law because he wanted to become a judge so that he could judge in favor of the Afghan Christians. And uh, another student that was at Kabul University at that time was uh, uh, a very extremist Islamic man uh, named uh, Hikmatyar. And Hikmatyar came to Zia and said, I know you have become a Christian. One day I'm going to uh, kill you for that. And uh, anyway, Zia was fearless. He was arrested. He was tortured. Uh, and uh, he learned many languages. He learned Russian when the Russians invaded. He spoke English perfectly. He learned German, and he won a scholarship to go to Germany uh, at a university there, and they didn't realize he was blind. When they found out, they said, no, we can't accept you. We don't have any accommodations for blind people. Zia said, I don't need any special accommodations. <laughs> and he would go and record all the lectures and, and listen to them. And so he became the number one student at that uh, university in Germany. Uh, and uh, then he entered a contest that he heard about sponsored by Saudi Arabia for quoting the Quran. And uh, it was a contest throughout the Muslim world. He won that contest. And when the uh, Arab officials realized it was a non-Arab that had won, <laughs> it was an embarrassment to them uh, because, you know, Afghans are, and Iranians are not Arabs. Uh, in fact, Islam was imposed on them by force. And uh, so they uh, quickly said, well, we're going to choose another uh, winner as well and, and picked another uh, uh, winner from uh, an Arab country. But uh, Zia, just uh, God used him to do some of the first translations of the Bible uh, into Dadi, uh, and he wrote books for, for children, uh, Christian books for children, and uh, just a wonderful man. He restarted the blind school after it was closed uh, when my parents had to leave, and uh, many Afghans came to faith came to Christ through uh, Zia's uh, strong witness. Uh, his father, Zia's father, came to my father and said, you know, before Zia came to the blind school, he was like a lump of coal. After coming to the blind school and coming to know the Lord, it's like that coal was lit on fire. It was a burning flame. Uh, and so Zia then ended up uh, having to go to Pakistan because of the persecution. And uh, he ended up meeting and rooming with uh, an Iranian pastor who uh, actually had come to Christ in Iran and had to flee Iran because his father, who was a big, famous wrestler and boxer, came after him to kill him, his own son with a knife once he found out that his son had uh, come to Christ. So uh, this man, Ramin Changizi, who is a pastor that our church supports, he fled to uh, Pakistan and ended up be rooming with Zia. They were roommates and got to know each other very well. And it uh, wasn't long after that that uh, Zia was kidnapped 
And uh, we found out later it was by this Hitmatiyar fanatical group, the extremists. And we heard later that uh, they told him he had to deny his faith and return to Islam or he would be killed. And he said, I would never do that. Uh, why would I betray my Lord? And I'm not afraid of dying whatsoever because uh, I know I'll be with my Lord. And they cut his tongue out because he they knew he was used to proclaim God's uh, truth. And then they killed him. Uh, but Zia is, is a, a known by Afghans around the world as, as a one of the heroes of the Christian faith, one of the first martyrs. Uh, and you know, uh, one time he came to my father and said, uh, in John 13, 34, our Lord Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. So Zia said, Dr. Wilson, why did Jesus say that this is a new command? We see that command throughout the Old Testament, the Shema, the Lord your God is one, and you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And then as uh, Jesus answered the, uh, the Jewish uh, leaders about uh, when they asked what is the greatest commandment, Jesus said, uh, there are two, love the Lord your God, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And all the Old Testament law and prophets hang on those two commandments. So in other words, love is the whole theme of the whole Bible, <clears throat> uh, to love God and love your neighbor. So Zia was saying, why did Jesus say this is a new command? Then he did some research and found out the answer himself. Because in 1 John 2.7, the answer is given, uh, where John, <laughs> the Apostle John, says, Dear friends, <clears throat> I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is a message you have heard. And then verse 8, yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. In other words, the reason it's new is because when Jesus came, God incarnate for the first time in history, we saw love embodied in our Lord Jesus and how he lived his life. And so this is uh, the the uh, example for all of us, it's new for us because now we have the, the uh, perfect example of how to live a life of love when we look at the life of our Lord Jesus and uh, we're to follow him. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And yes, Jesus was full of love. But as John says in John 1, uh, he came from the Father full of grace and truth. So we see that perfect balance. If we overemphasize grace and love, then it becomes uh, very ineffective and weak. And, you know, but when it's in the, under the structure of truth and balance with truth, uh, then we have the right balance and bringing God's uh, love to the world. Uh, we need that because truth on its own can be hard and cold. <laughs> but when you have truth and combined with love, then uh, we have the most effective uh, witness uh, for the world. And our light shines brightly in this dark world. You know, last Saturday, March 9th, uh, Pastor Amin, who's based in Hamburg, Germany, uh, uh, was invited to speak at a large celebration of uh, new Bible translations for daddy, the Afghan language. Uh, it's called, it's a dialect of Farsi. It's called daddy because it comes from the language of Darius. And so it's considered the more ancient form of, of Farsi, stemming back to the time of the great King Darius. 
Uh, anyway, these new translations of the Bibles have just been completed by an Afghan team of Afghans, Christian Afghans, Dari and Hazara, which is one of the large uh, groups of people in Afghanistan. In fact, they're some of the most open to the gospel because they've been so oppressed, especially by the uh, Taliban and the Pashtuns. Uh, and then also uh, a new Bible in Pashtu. Uh, so they had a big dedication of these Bibles and celebration. So Pastor Ramin went there and uh, shared about uh, the work that my mother and father started in Afghanistan and also shared about Zia. And they had uh, just a true celebration. Pray now that these Bibles will get distributed and get into the hands of, of the right people. And I, of course, through the internet, they'll be available through the internet uh, soon as well. But uh, I want to just close because uh, it's 8.48, uh, and I want to allow uh, maybe a little time if any of you have questions. But uh, Pastor Ramin is one, as I mentioned, one of the ones we support. Uh, we, uh, I just want to mention this too. We support uh, a lady, a French lady, who is right in Kabul running a school of over 400 students. Even during the time of the Taliban, they had to close the school a little bit uh, after, right after the Taliban takeover. But within four months, she went right back there as a woman, and she went to the new minister of education, a Taliban, a young Taliban official, <clears throat> and said, look, this school <clears throat> has been operating since 2001. She and her husband had started. Her husband passed away about five years ago. But uh, she said, we need to restart this school. And this school shouldn't be under any of your laws uh, 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 that forbid education of women because we're a, an NGO. We're not part of the Afghan government. And the Taliban official was like surprised at the courage and boldness of this women, French women. And so they gave permission. And the, the school was reopened and is thriving now, even under the Taliban. And they get visits from the Taliban. And one of the visits, some of the Taliban officials said, you know, you should spread a school like this throughout other cities in Afghanistan. Because <laughs> they see uh, how uh, efficient and well-run it is and how happy all the students are. And they uh, started a, a special school for uh, uh, ones that are deaf, because there's a lot of deafness in Afghanistan, and also ones who are mentally disabled, uh, which in an Islamic society, they're just kind of pushed aside and hidden. You know, they're an embarrassment, but they are uh, taught sign language and uh, just uh, valued, and you see the smiles in the faces of these children and how, and you know, uh, 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 Ariana is his name, her name. She's not allowed to teach the Bible or teach Christian faith, but she doesn't need to. Her life and the staff and the teachers are 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 living testimonies of their faith. And so, uh, many of the students come to her privately and talk about her faith. And and uh, the families of these students are all impacted uh, by this. Uh, and by the way, she uh, had wrote a book a couple of years ago in French uh, entitled From Colmar to Kabul. Uh, I don't know if you can, From Colmar to Kabul. And uh, it was in French, and it's the story of she and her husband uh, coming to faith uh, after they lost their 10 year old son to a, a tragedy and with cancer their lives are revolved around their son. And when they lost him, they went on a spiritual journey and found the Lord. And then the Lord led them to uh, start this uh, work in Afghanistan. Uh, and so it was in French and had a huge impact uh, in France. She was on the TV shows and many uh, French people came to faith in reading this uh, book about Ariane, Ariane and her husband, a wonderful lady. Uh, anyway, our youngest daughter, who uh, went to France for a year at uh, university, uh, study abroad and learned French, she translated it from French to English. So now it's available. Uh, you can order it from Amazon. 
I encourage all of you to order that from Colmar to Kabul uh, and read this amazing story, a journey from tragedy to hope. And that's an example of uh, how God is working mightily, even under the dark shadows of the evil that is there in Afghanistan. Uh, and so uh, she's one that our church supports. And But Ramin, uh, he uh, is based in Hamburg, Germany with his wife. And this Sunday, he is uh, going to Tajikistan uh, for the uh, Noruz, the, the Persian New Year period, which is the biggest holiday in the Persian world. Uh, and uh, also, he's going to go to Uzbekistan. And uh, he meets with the pastors that he's been training through Zoom, uh, the Tajik pastors. And there's some Afghan pastors also, because the Afghans have gone into Tajikistan as refugees. And uh, so uh, he meets with them, and then they do a evangelistic outreach, and they're traveling. And Sister Manijay knows all about this because she herself has gone to Tajikistan and gone to the border of Afghanistan and prayed for the people of Afghanistan and even wanted to cross over the river. But uh, one of the officials said, no, you better not do that or you'll be arrested. But uh, so uh, anyway, in uh, God is working and giving these pastors who Ramin uh, has his PhD in theology as well as uh, master's in psychology. So he teaches seminary level training for these pastors uh, and he's meeting with them there and uh, they go throughout the country and uh, have special outreaches. But uh, he uh, last time shared with us uh, because he tries to go there uh, at least twice a year. Uh, and last time he shared one of the Tajik pastors, and I'll close with this. Uh, his name is Pastor uh, Ibrahim, Abraham. And he was a former imam, uh, head of a mosque, a large mosque in Tajikistan. And uh, he would persecute Christians. Well, one time in these persecution uh, trips, uh, much like Paul, the Apostle Paul, trying to round up the Christians, the Lord himself appeared to him and said, Abraham, why are you fighting against me? Much like he asked Paul, why are you, <laughs> uh, you know, against me? Uh, and so uh, uh, Abraham found that, yes, Jesus is God. And, and he asked Jesus a lot of questions <laughs> that Jesus answered. And then uh, he committed his life to the Lord and then went back to the mosque that he was in charge of and started preaching about the Lord as his savior. <laughs> as you can imagine, uh, the, uh, the people in the mosque did not take well to that, at least most of them, especially the other leaders. So they kicked him out and then tried to kill him. Three different attempts, they tried to kill him. The first time they had a gun and they shot it right at his head and the bullet didn't come out. And uh, and then the last time they actually came to his house and took him away and said, they said, say goodbye to your family. And they took him outside the city to Romal Park and said, okay, now you can dig your grave if you want to be buried. Or if not, we'll just kill you now, chop your head off and your body will be lying here in the open ground. And he got down on his knees and uh, said, well, before you kill me, can I pray for you? And uh, he started praying for each one of these men that his, some of them he knew, praying that the Lord would touch them with his love and reveal himself to them and help them and, and uh, blessing their families. And these men could not believe that this one they were going to kill was showing so much love and care for their families. And uh, so they <laughs> abandoned the idea <laughs> of uh, killing them, let them go. And then uh, later they saw answers to the prayers, the specific prayers he had made for them. And so uh, they came back to him and said, we want to learn more about uh, the one that you're following. And some of them came to Christ. But now, uh, Abraham is a pastor in Tajikistan, in Dushanbe, a wonderful pastor of a church there, and one of the ones that Pastor Ramin is, is training. 
So uh, praise God. I wanted to end on that uh, testimony of how lives are being transformed. God is answering your prayers. And we're seeing a tremendous movement of God. And I believe we're going to see the greatest spiritual awakening that the world has ever seen. Uh, and uh, uh, a, it will be centered. As much as I'd like to say in America, no, it will be centered in Persia. You look at the history of how God has used Persia uh, and the prophecy in Jeremiah 49, 39 says that uh, in the last days, God will remove the wicked leaders. They're awful wicked leaders in Iran and Afghanistan now. And he will establish his throne of righteousness in Elam, which is the heart of Iran. Uh, and then he will restore the fortunes of Elam. Uh, in other words, he's going to make it great or a greater than the time of King Cyrus who is the great Persian king who commissioned the Jewish exiles to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. He not only uh, commissioned them, he paid for it. He provided uh, uh, protection for them and just an amazing uh, Persian leader. And he, even the secular world describes him as the founder of human rights. That was, uh, and then after him, Darius, that was the peak of the Persian empire. Uh, this prophecy is saying God is going to restore the fortunes of Persia to be greater than the time of Cyrus. And the reason is because the underground church now will be released and have freedom, and they're going to uh, uh, impact all the surrounding Muslim nations. And it will be a key part of the a final greatest spiritual awakening and revival that the world has ever seen.